Testing, testing. All right, welcome back to class. Hope you guys had uh, an amazing um, uh, 4th of July break. Uh, today's lecture is 15A. We are finished with the unit on computability theory, and we're beginning our unit on complexity theory. The, the title of today's lecture is P, which really stands for uh, polynomial time whether or not that'll fit in the YouTube title uh, is to be determined. And then, so the first half of the, today's lecture is going to be P. The second half is going to be NP, which stands for non-deterministic. Uh, polynomial time. Uh, I'm not sure if that'll fit in the YouTube title either. We'll have to see. Um, so we finished uh, a, a huge discussion on the theory of uh, computation with respect to possibility. Like what, given um, uh, a certain defined problem, is it solvable at all, you know? Um, and today we're concerned with, with the second half of this course, really, a, wholly, a totally different unit, which is on complexity theory. Um, so computability theory uh, computability theory is really like uh, solvable at all. We proved that there exist unsolvable problems. We proved, you know, um, the halting problem and uh, through reduction, many other related problems are as unsolvable as the halting problem, including a small problem uh, with little domino tiles, right? Uh, complexity um, is not, is a, it's sort of a uh, like intuitive restriction of computability theory. Complexity theory, computational complexity theory, is a study of uh, what problems are um, solvable given a, given a s amount of uh, amount of resource. So. Uh, it's a very different, uh, so P and NP are two definitions, and I, it could take me three minutes to define them, and I could move on, but I want to spend today really detailing what's, what, you know, what are we put on this earth to do, why are you taking this course, what's going on, uh, and so it's, it's really just, I'm just going to ramble for like two hours and see what happens. Um, computability theory, uh, it, I think, this is the unit we just finished, and I think this is a very beautiful theory. It's, it, in some sense, it's complete, right, so Alan Turing... So this is, we talked about a program that existed from 300 BC. It began with Euclid. He was asking questions he didn't know answers to. And it took all the way to Alan Turing, uh, you know, Hilbert, Gödel, Russell, uh, and so on. And finally, the, the final nail in the, in, the, in the coffin was done by Alan Turing. And since after Alan Turing, so Alan Turing's paper was 1936, there's really only two main results in computability theory after that in the entire 20th century. There was... Alan Turing solved the problem on the, the word problem for semigroups. Uh, we won't talk about what that is. And then there was a problem in the 70s that was solved, which was also one of Hilbert's problems. Hilbert's 10th problem was um, given a general Diophantine equation, does it have uh, integral solutions? This was proved to be unsolvable as well. Um, so it was like, what was that? Uh, in the 70s by Martin Davis, Hilary Putnam, uh, Julia Robinson, and then uh, Yuri Matyasevich. And, um, it's a very difficult proof. It would, might take a whole course to uh, get through that one. Uh, but since then, there really hasn't been uh, concerning questions in computability theory. Uh, of course, there has been. Like, you know, there are people who still study this and work on this, but they're not computer scientists, and they're they're not really concerned with um, in the same kind of computability theory that we were, in the sense that it was a reflection of of uh, ourselves. They're concerned with maybe some extremal problems, you know, given unrealistic scenarios. Those questions are, of course, worth asking, but uh, they make us, like as a field of computer scientists, lose interest. Complexity theory sort of was like a next generation in the 60s. Like, certainly certain, certain problems are solvable, fine. Certain problems are solvable, certain problems are unsolvable, fine. Are certain problems solvable with, within given resource? I'm using the word resource here, but it, computational complexity theory is about any resource. The resource we most care about, though, is going to be time, right? 
the other resources are space. You can really measure the complexity of any resource, maybe joules of energy. I saw someone do that one time. I was like, okay, I, I mean, go off. Um, you can come up maybe randomness, like let's say your algorithm has access to certain random bits, like maybe certain maybe randomness has a cost associated with it. You have a cost function, and you're like the more randomness, it's more expensive. You want to reduce randomness in some sense. You can measure uh, within uh, you know is this is a certain problem solvable within a resource bound um, with, with with you know fewer than so many random access random randomness uh, checks. Time though is the most important uh, resource. Uh, of any other resource because like you never get the time back, right? You, uh, you're going forward and you know, you're always in the present in some sense. Um, space is a very different resource. We'll have a whole lecture on, on space complexity, but time complexity is, is, has, the, has the more interesting problems. Um, the reason I bring up the history of computability and complexity is because computability theory is mostly solved. There was sort of a, a hero's journey kind of thing we did with the um, uh, the results of Russell and uh, Godel and Turing. And I, if I were to characterize these as like movie genres, I would talk about computability being kind of like a drama, right? So there was, you know, climaxes and there was uh, uh, cliffhangers and uh, historical cliffhangers, not necessarily like in the presentation. Um, but then there's like a, a finale with uh, the result, and there's not really much left to do. It was perhaps an unsatisfying end, but we knew what the end was. You know, sometimes you, you know you might not like the end of a movie, but you can't argue that the movie didn't end. Basically, um, complexity theory, in some sense, has a different kind of beauty because I would call if if computability theory could be characterized as a drama, I would characterize uh, complexity theory as a heart. We really have no idea how to solve any question in complexity theory ever. Um, it, it, the history of computability theory is like really finding out what we're doing and realizing our own limits. The history of complexity theory is like a history of failure. So write that down. Make sure. You know that part. So, um, we really have no idea how to solve any problems because all the problems are sort of through a web of implica implications and connections are related back to one important problem, which is the P versus NP problem. Um, anyone who teaches a complexity course is going to give you sort of like an ideolo ideological representation of what they think complexity theory means. You know, and you can kind of tell this. Uh, when you read different books about presentation of complexity theory, because people have widely, that's not true for other sciences, I think, but people have wildly different perspectives on what it means. Um, maybe without getting too specific, I've seen perspectives that are like, you know, complexity theory is, a, is, a, is the, the point of complexity theory is to study a sort of science of hardness. Um, and using that, we can better understand algorithms. So in some sense, it's like an algorithmic perspective. We understand limitations of algorithms that helps us build better algorithms. It's purely a constructive view. There's another view which is like, um, you know, complexity theorists are really good at understanding what makes a problem easier or what makes a problem hard. And then that is useful just enough to help build cryptographic foundations. Like you can go and just build pseudo random number generators and one way functions and things like this. It's a very applied uh, view of uh, complexity theory. I like complexity theory, and there's other. Perspectives. Everyone will have a different perspective. You know, maybe it's reflective of nature or something. I like I like complexity theory because I like this problem. Um, P versus NP. It's a very hard problem. Um, that's sort of an understatement. There is no other field I can think of that has been littered with um, metaphorical graves of scientists who have tried to solve this problem and failed um, spectacularly. And in some sense, it is, a, it is a millennial prize problem. If you're a computer scientist, you've probably heard of this problem. I mean, there's no way you haven't, even if you haven't heard of P or NP. Today, you're going to get the best formal treatment of the problem, of course. But you may not even have a formal treatment of the problem, and you have some colloquial characterization of what it, what it means. Um, this is a problem that is so hard, it's sort of like... We don't know how to solve it, but we really know how hard it is in some sense. Like we have, we talked extensively about diagonalization as a proof technique. Diagonalization is a technique which can be used to separate uh, 
classes. We were able to, Godel was able to use it to separate the true from the provable, right? Everything that is provable is true, but he was able to show that there exists something which is true but not provable. Diagonalization technique. Uh, Alan Turing was able to use diagonalization to separate what we now call uh, the decidable from the undecidable or the recognizable. He was able to show that there is something recognizable, but it can't be decidable. So like a sword, diagonalization is really good at taking two classes and then just kind of like cutting through them. And then you have a, you have a, uh, you can take any like sort of um, containment and then show it strict using diagonalization like a knife. We can, not only can diagonalization not separate uh, P from NP, but we can prove that diagonalization can't separate P from NP. Uh, that's going to take some lectures for us to build up. But in some sense, that's sort of a, like, a, like a loose proof theoretic idea. How do you know that there is no proof of something using a specific technique? To me, I think that is arcane, and that's beautiful, and that's kind of why I like it. Um, there were attempts, of course, to separate P from NP. Um, and complexity is really just, again, a restricted form of computability theory. We're asking certain problems, not if they're solvable at all, but solvable within a certain resource. That's kind of just like you put a, you put a restriction, a timer on, uh, like quite literally a timer on the problems uh, of computability theory. And there was some belief at the time that maybe we could separate P from NP as quickly as we could have separated the decidable from the recognizable. Some simple proof is enough to, to cut through here. Um, and then we started getting results like this one. It's called, it's called the relativization barrier, where uh, we'll talk about what that means. But the fact that you cannot use diagonalization or other related techniques to separate these two is, means the proof of P versus NP would have to be very difficult. Um, the history of complexity theory, again, is a history of failure. People develop new techniques uh, all the time and attempt to... Um, you know, try and separate this, uh, or not even this problem specifically, but any of the many slightly easier but related problems, you know. It's kind of like a wheel of history. Like you, uh, basically what has happened is like, people develop some techniques, they try, they get some very extremely weak results, and then they mention, you know, maybe perhaps this technique can separate P from NP. Uh, that's the goal, that's the, you know, that's the, the golden, the goose right there. But then someone else comes along 10, 15 years later after people spend all the, you know, a life, a career trying to separate P from NP using these techniques. Someone comes along with a result that says, you can't use these techniques actually. And that is devastating and has destroyed lives and so on, right? So it's happened at least three times um, throughout uh, complexity theory where people invent a technique, try to use the technique, generations of papers pass. The technique is shown it cannot, it cannot find the golden goose. New tech, and by that deficiency, we get new techniques, and the cycle continues. Yeah. To give you an example, all the proofs we did are what we will call, well, we won't talk about it too much today, but they, we, they, what we're, they, they are what we call relativized. They, they are relativizing proofs. And then there was a paper that showed there is no relativizing proof. Okay, we have to find, quote unquote, non-relativizing techniques. We find some non-relativizing techniques using circuits, circuit complexity. Then all the circuit complexity proofs kind of have the same pattern to them. And then somebody else, Razborov and Rudich, show that P versus NP has no proof that has this kind of structure. Um, it's called, it, they say like, uh, it's actually called P versus NP has no um, natural proof. So we know a proof of P versus NP now can't be relativizing and can't be quote unquote natural. We don't know what those words mean yet, but. Um, and so on, there's, there's, these, there's these like barriers to the problem that make it, uh, that I don't think any other field has any other problems to solve. You know, like for Matt's last theorem was an open problem for, for decades, but it wasn't because the, we knew that certain techniques couldn't solve it. It was just that uh, it was just really hard, you know. There are other open problems. Uh, the Poincaré conjecture used to be open. It's solved now. Um, what are the other open problems? Yang-Mills things? I'm, the equation, differential equation. Um, I think that one's Yang-Mills. Could be wrong. No, that's the one with the, uh, how can I not, it's, I have to look it up. P versus NP, you can keep looking it up, yeah. P versus NP is such a hard problem, it was named as one of these millennial prize problems in the early 2000s. People tried and failed repeatedly to solve it, so they just named it one of the, one of the top hardest problems. Um, it's Navier-Stokes. Navier-Stokes. Out of my domain there on that one, but uh, you know these are hard. I think the more I think the moral of those problems is like they're just hard. 
for the sake of being hard. You know, go, the other ones, uh, gold batch conjecture, you know, uh, uh, Colat's conjecture, and so on, right? We just don't have the tools to solve these. Here, not only do we not have the tools, but we know we don't have the tools. And we sort of provably know we don't have the tools. That's what makes this so difficult and so mysterious. And to me, it's kind of lovely. Well, in a horrific way, because so many people have failed uh, to do it. Because the problem is also so colloquially easy to define, but we know how difficult it is to solve, it also attracts a certain kind of um, internet troll that's like uh, every, I get maybe 20 papers a year um, in my inbox or just on the internet or something that say like, uh, here's a proof of P versus NP. And it's like some obvious technique, like and there's some, the problem with, with these papers is like finding the technique, finding the error in the paper is, can be as hard as uh, writing the paper. So it's like, it's just exhausting to try and go through these things. And they never look at previous work. They never look at like relativizing or whatever, right? They don't know what they don't know, basically. So they think they've solved a problem based off of, of an easy description that they have of the problem, you know? Even recently there was like, uh, two, in algorithms, we proved two sat was in P and that three sat was in NP. We'll talk extensively about NP completeness, I think next lecture, if I did my math right. Uh, and then this guy came up with a reduction. I might be confusing which hack paper because I just see you know so many of them. He, um, he came up with a reduction from three sat to two sat. And if you recall, uh, you probably don't, but if you recall from our algorithms course, you have a reduction to a problem which is in P. You suddenly have a polynomial time algorithm for every problem in NP, and therefore you've shown that P is in, NP is in P, and therefore P equals NP. Um, of course it was wrong, you know, is, but catching these, catching these bugs is, is very subtle. Another one, uh, another hack paper I want to mention was by some guy at like Louisville. And he basically tried to give a lower bound on uh, the traveling salesman problem, which we know is NP complete. And he used a hash function to try and s prevent any algorithm from determining local information. Uh, that's not, we don't want to get too technical. So the hash function like prevents you from doing things like graph search because in a very complicated way, you kind of like hash the graph and then you can't perform traversal on it. So no, here use this obviously has to be NP, NP complete. Because it's like, it's just, you're like looking at garbage or whatever. The problem is, is the hash function only has the assumed properties. Do you guys know what a hash function is? Like SHA, right? It, like you get, it's deterministic, but it always gives you a random looking output. But if you give it the same file, it'll always give you the same randomness, right? It's not random, it's deterministic, but it looks random. And that's, that's good enough, right? Um, the problem is, is that a hash function does, is not proved to have those properties that we desire. Experimentally, it overwhelmingly does have those properties, statistical properties. But the, the P does not equal NP is a characterization of the existence of one-way functions. So the hash function provably only has those properties if P does not equal NP. So the guy trying to prove P does not equal NP using a hash function implicitly assumes the hash function has those properties. So by doing so, he's assumed P does not equal NP and um, the proof is wrong. But catching it, come on. Okay, catching a catching a bug like that in a paper is impossible, you know, because he never he never mentions the assumed properties of the hash function. So it, it it's an incredibly um, a holy problem. It's it, it, there is no harder problem, and there's no problem I think anyone else thinks about every single hour of every day. Not in a way like you know a solution to the problem, but just. Um, like how awesome the problem is in order to command the field of, of uh, to bring in, you know, scientists to their knees for generations. It's, uh, um, and it's kind of sad because, you know, the, 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 the computer science is a relatively young discipline. Physics is hundreds of years old. Uh, mathematics is thousands of years, years old. Biology is a couple hundred years old. Computer science is not even a hundred years old. Alan Turing's paper is 1936. It's currently 2023. So we're not even there yet, like to a centennial. Um, but the first generation of complexity theorists are now like retiring and dying off. So they're not going to know the solution to the, to the problem. It's going to become a multi-generational problem. They're going to, they're not going to see the solution to the problem if there even is one. So uh, 
pretty, pretty, pretty terrible, pretty terrible problem. Uh, really horrific. So we now, uh, I've lost track of time. We now know quite well the difference between uh, computability theory and complexity theory. I want to talk quickly about the difference between algorithms uh, and complexity. So an algorithm, in some sense, is a solution, right? You have all taken an algorithms class. You remember doing the actual algorithms. You did a breath for a search or Bellman Ford or Knapsack or I'm trying to think. Um, Ford Fulkerson. Ford Fulkerson. Chain matrix. Uh, you actually sat there and you worked through the problems and you did the problems. So the algorithms is really about the solution to the problem. And complexity is kind of, in this perspective, is about the problems themselves. So they have a duality here because you can study. Uh, complexity allows you, like, algorithms allows you to study upper bounds on the problem. That's the way I like to think of it, right? Uh, but complexity allows you to study, like, lower bounds of the problem. You can relate the hardness of the problem to the hardness of other problems. And by doing so, perhaps you can learn something about you know, what makes this problem difficult and so on. So algorithms is, is sort of a constructive, like you, you given, you're given a fixed task and you, can, you figure out a way to do it, right? Complexity, you may be able to learn something about all possible, you have to consider, you given a certain problem, you're considering the space of all possible algorithms which can solve that problem. So it's, a sort, of a, it's sort of like a yin-yang kind of thing going on. It's like a duality uh, thing. In uh, in the algorithms course, we do an extensive unit of NP-completeness. And what that ends up meaning is like every reduction is itself relating the hardness of two problems. But the reduction itself is just an algorithm. So that algorithm is why we study it in algorithms. Um, all right, so like for a specific problem in complexity, you're studying the, uh, all, the space of all possible uh, solutions to it in some sense. So we now know what complexity theory is. Now let's go and uh, like do a foundational introduction to it. So first, we need a computational model. Uh, what computational models do we know? I don't think I've used those words before. What computers do we know? Turing machine. Turing machine. Now, Turing machine, luckily for us, is the only real kind of computational model that we know of because it's convenient and it's nice. And it's actually very useful for complexity. Um, but it wasn't the only computational model at the time. There was other things that were competing with it that are weird. you know. And the reason we don't talk about them is because they're kind of weird. There was a whole uh, a theory called recursive function theory where you have a sort of a functional-like um, understanding of, uh, uh, of the, you know, it is a Turing-complete system, but it's in, a, it's in like a weird notation. It's functional. If you recall, the definition of a Turing machine allows it to be well adapted for us to study uh, what makes some problems easy and what makes other problems hard. The Turing machine, by, defined by Alan Turing, has a whole thing about it, about the physical realizability in its definition. If you recall, like one of the main points of it is, is it does what? Finite work in finite time. So at any number, at any steps uh, that have passed, uh, you've only done a finite amount of work. That is, in, in some sense, such a, such a trivial observation. But it ends up being perfect to characterize uh, exactly why the Turing machine makes such a good model. Um, so, but which Turing machine? Which there's a, we actually gave several definitions of the Turing machine. We gave uh, first we get the one tape, uh, the classic deterministic Turing machine. We had the um, a K tape machine, a deterministic Turing machine. So these we proved these were all equivalent to each other. But the problem was is now we're talking about resource. So now we have to determine how equivalent are they to each other. Maybe one is faster than the other. Certainly they can do the same thing, but now one might be faster. Yes? Uh, 
I thought we talked about sewing machines where like it just on the tape goes a a a a and that goes forever. Yes. Would that be finite work? So that's a great question. It turns out that all the complexity classes that we will define in a useful sense have to halt. So every like we'll, we will define P as languages as as languages which have Turing machines to decide them in, poly, in a polynomial number of steps. Um, so the Turing machine has to halt on every input in a polynomial number of steps. So w the the machine which loops infinitely at every at every, any, if you consider pausing the machine and just looking at it, it has only done a finite amount of work. Sure, as a process, it will continue to diverge. But if you just pause it, you know, it, ha it has only done finitely many things. At each step, that definition of a Turing machine specifically uh, does one thing in, in one step, you know. Uh, that was a great question. Because sometimes it's, it's, not, it's not sure, like, if, uh, like, where do the, the non-halting languages fit in? The theory is less um, conceptual and thing because all the things do halt, right? You can, in some sense, just run the clock to decide something that you don't need to. Like, a bounded halt, for example, would be decidable. Just does it, instead of does m halt on w, just the, the question would, would be modified, does m halt on w within this bound? That's decidable by you just run the clock to the bound and then, you know, congrats. Um, Right, so we talked about a K-tape. We had talked about one tape deterministic Turing machine, a K-tape deterministic Turing machine. We talked about a non-deterministic Turing machine. And this one is not really real, right? It's got this magic superpower of non-determinism. We'll have to come back to that one on the lecture uh, next half of the, of the course, the next half of today's lecture. We, we agree that non-determinism is not physically realizable. It seems kind of magic. So we'll think about that one later. Uh, when we define NP. Today we're trying to define P, uh, at least in this first half. We also talked, to, we didn't talk about it, but there's also something called the word RAM model. And RAM stands for random access machine. And word just basically means it has this fixed word size. And this is technically the automata that is used in algorithms. But it is, when you write the algorithms, it's not really essential that you go to the automata level to perform the analysis of the, of the runtime. So we don't, it's not really mentioned, but this is sort of, the um, the model um, random access here basically means that the machine the difference between random access and a Turing machine is that the Turing machine must move left or right a single cell or some finite number of cells the the RAM um, is random access so what it can do is actually it has a s minimal instruction set addition jump conditional jump whatever but it can jump. It can go to, you can, a Turing machine to go from cell one to cell 10 has to take 10 steps. The word RAM machine is allowed to jump. The word part is that each cell contains a fixed word size, so 64 bits or whatever, right? Um, so these are three models, uh, at least for now, that I want, I want to talk about. So just to see if, does the model matter? I want to argue that it kind of does, it, at least at first, and then maybe we can talk, figure out a way that we can make it not matter. So um, consider uh, PAL is a language, and PAL is a language of palindromes. So W, uh, WR, it doesn't really matter. We can just make it even palindromes, uh, Ws and sigma star. This is a language which um, is palindromes, right? So I want to consider the algorithms, uh, but specific to these machines that can decide uh, the palindromes. So word RAM, if we were to give pseudocode to decide PAL, uh, what would we do? Well, here's, here's my solution. And what's the cool thing about being a theorist is I can just like be really terrible at programming. So I can say N is going to take on, I'll say like uh, def f of s, N takes on the length of s uh, for i in range uh, N. Uh, if s of i does not equal s of n minus i, reject, uh, accept. So kind of loose. Maybe there's some undefined behavior in there. Playing um, uh, like a... I don't know what it's called. You're not wearing clothes, right? You just, I don't have to figure out if that's code or not, right? Um, 
what's the runtime of this code? O of n. This is O of n. OK, so given the high level description of a word RAM model I talked about, we could decide PAL in O of n time. Um, when we talk about algorithms on the other variants of Turing machines, you can't do such high level code because there's certain specific things that happen. For example, here, we're looking at the ith element of the string, but then we're also looking at the n minus ith element of the string. If, if I were to write it like this, uh, let's say we have a, b, c, dot, 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 c, b, a. Somehow we're looking at this and this at the same step. And a Turing machine has a tape head, so it's not allowed to do that. When you compile this code, you actually go to some minimal set of instructions or something. What happens is there is a, a pointer and stuff, and it does look at both of those eventually, and it jumps. This doesn't happen in a single step, but it does happen in constantly many, because it's allowed to read one, jump, and then read the other, and make that comparison. It stores those values in registers, performs a comparison, and so on. Um, let's consider algorithms that run on a K-tape uh, deterministic Turing machine. So here's the algorithm I claim it's going to work. We have, uh, first I'm actually going to prove it not just for K-tape, and of course we, to differentiate these two, I'm talking about a uh, like K greater than 2 tape. So I'm going to prove, I'm going to give an algorithm that runs on a 2 tape deterministic Turing machine. So basically, the de two-tape deterministic Turing machine is going to begin with. Oh, I have a lot of room in this. It's going to begin with the input on uh, one tape, right? So we have two tapes. How should I draw it? I guess I'll draw it like this. And the machine is initialized with the pointers like this, right? So. Maybe I should draw it a little. So let's, let me see if I can give a fast algorithm to decide palindromes. And again, to decide the input is on the tape, you want to say yes or no. right? We're not trying to solve a problem necessarily. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to, uh, I can put it here. I'm going to, first I'm going to copy the input to the second tape. Then I'm going to reset one of the tape heads. And then I'm going to loop the tape heads in opposite directions. So it's going to be similar to that, it turns out, just with some more, some more words involved, basically. So it's going to look like this. Um, the first tape is not written to or, or uh, read. It's only read from. I, this head is going to move. It's going to make that typewriter noise. You're going to get to here, and it's going to stop writing. It's going to stop reading. And as it's looping, it's copying what it reads to the second tape. So at this moment, this is what the this is. After n steps, we're at this is what uh, our configuration of the machine looks like. Now. Um, I'm going to reset one tape head. Uh, let's say I reset the top. So the two tape heads were at the end of the input. Now I've reset one to the beginning of the input, OK? I don't have the ability to animate this, so you're just going to have to kind of imagine it. I'm going to loop this tape head this way and loop this tape head this way. And I'm going to compare what the both tape heads see. Right now, both tape heads see an A, first and last, fine. Then they're going to move that way. It's going to, they're both going to see B. Then they're both going to see C. And at any moment, if they don't see the same symbol, we don't like them. We're going to say we reject. Um, what is the runtime of this algorithm? It's O of n, yeah. So copying takes O of n. Uh, I can be explicit. We can say it takes n. Copying takes n. It takes exactly the size of the input. Um, resetting one tape head. The thing has to go from here to here. It's going to go takes exactly n steps. Um, then, the, each instruction, uh, each step of the Turing machine is allowed to move both heads. So it's going to move each head at the same time. 
it's going to take o, it's going to take n, not even o of n, just n. So this this machine takes quite literally three n steps, which is o of n. So it does take o of n time to uh, do it on a two tape Turing machine, right? Now we're restricting the definition of computer we're using more and more. What about a one tape deterministic Turing machine? This is a tricky one. So here's an algorithm for a one tape deterministic Turing machine. Notice this algorithm was really sped up by the second tape. We were able to use this. In general, you can use more tapes for fast copying. But one tape is kind of bad. It's kind of ugly, right? So the tape head is going to be, let's say it starts here. Okay. Here's one algorithm. I'm going to read the first, here's the, like, the trivial algorithm. Okay. I'm going to read A, move all the way over there. Check if it's also an A. Then I'm going to move to B, and then I'm going to check if B matches this B. Then I'm going to move to the C, and then check if C matches the C. Right? Then I want to move to whatever this would be, D or whatever, and then check if D matches this, and so on. Here's a kicker. What is the runtime of this algorithm? It looks like n squared. It is n squared. Uh, just to be slightly more ex explicit, it's going to be like n plus n minus 2 plus n minus 4 and so on. And that's kind of like 1 plus 2 plus 3, right? Which by, do you remember the name of why that's n squared? Gauss's trick. Uh, this is O of n squared, right? So I was only able to give an uh, n squared upper bound on the complexity of the palindrome problem on a one-tape Turing machine, but I was able to easily give linear time problems on uh, the complexity of palindromes on these other automata. Why on these other automata is this actually uh, also a linear time lower bound? Can you repeat the question? On a word RAM computer and on a two-tape Turing machine, we proved a linear time upper bound. Why is there, and just to get, this is a warm-up to get comfortable with talking about lower bounds. Why is there a linear time lower bound as well? You don't know where the separation starts. Mm. <laughs> oh my god. So the answer I'm looking for is actually most trivial algorithms have to have hold on. Okay. Most trivial problems have to have a linear time lower bound. Basically all of them have linear time lower bounds. Uh, why? You take it takes linear time to read the input. So if you have a sublinear time algorithm, it doesn't have time to read the entire input. So suppose there was an algorithm that ran in time n minus 1. Not even forget the big O for a second. It ran in time n minus 1. Um, it, then it doesn't have time to look at every symbol. So there is a symbol it missed. So you can construct a string that is all palindrome except in one space where that symbol is, and it would be incorrect. The algorithm would then be incorrect. What is the only algorithm you should know that is sublinear time? Like binary search? Binary search is logarithmic time, and binary search is so fast because it doesn't have to look at everything. If binary search has to loop over the whole array, it takes linear time. It, it does these logarithmically many jumps. It only has that, that guaranteed success because you assume the input is sorted, which is you know fine. Um, but using that, it's, it's able to achieve the sublinear time thing. And I mentioned that specifically because binary search does not look at the whole input. That's the reason it's so fast. Um, so these all have linear time lower bounds as well. We have a matching upper bound and a lower bound, right? So we have an upper bound of O of n. And just, by the, just because this argument about looking at the entire input, we have a, we have a lower bound of O of n for both of these. Um, we actually, through a very difficult proof, have a lower bound of n squared for the one tape Turing machine. Any single tape deterministic Turing machine to decide palindromes has to take quadratic time. Uh, there's two proofs of this. One is a very insane combinatorial argument, not very funny, kind of pumping-like. One is 
Uh, and the other one uses Kolmogorov complexity. I've previously given this proof as like a final exam question. Uh, like the whole final is just prove this thing. It's broken into pieces and so on. And I have a copy of that online somewhere. But basically the idea is like if there did exist a sub quadrant, you like assume to the contrary that there is a Turing machine, a single tape deterministic Turing machine that runs in sub quadratic time, like asymptotically sub quadratic time. Uh, if such a machine did exist, then you could trick the machine into compressing a string too small for you. We discussed the proof of the primality of primes last time, right? It's kind of same idea. Uh, slightly more involved, but you can use Kolmogorov complexity to prove Turing machine lower bounds, it turns out. So here we have the fact that the, basically the takeaway here is that the definition of the Turing machine does matter. If you use K tapes, certain problems are faster. If you use one tapes, certain problems are slower. Uh, there is a big difference it turns out between linear time and quadratic time, right? What is the better model of algorithms? What is the better model of the computer? It really depends. Um, so the book, any complexity book is going to begin with the definition of a Turing machine. It's going to give you a fixed definition and say, we're going to measure time with respect to this model. And one of the common ones is a three-tape Turing machine, which the first tape is finite and fixed and contains the input. And then the other two are just tapes. Maybe sometimes algorithm papers, they care explicitly about the word, word RAM model. That's, what, that's their uh, thing. So uh, the, we have just proved that the model does matter. But we want it really not to matter, because computation should be independent of the model, really. So the, uh, we recall we define regular context-free. These are classes of languages. Uh, time of f of n is equal to the class of languages decidable by a Turing machine which uh, halts uh, uh, within f of n steps on an input of uh, size uh, n. Right. So immediately we have something kind of thing. And it really should be big O of f of n here. But I like to play a little fast and loose. Maybe that's bad. We have some clear like uh, things we can say about time f of n immediately. Like anything decidable in linear time is also decidable in quadratic time, right? If you have a linear time algorithm for something, you certainly have a quadratic time problem for something. Um, similarly, we can define the classes like uh, n time. Uh, and space and n space. So complexity is like full of these like incredible names of things. There's just so many things to keep track of. And the relationship between them is even more complex, right? If you think of each thing like a node in a graph and you have an arrow between them, you have quadratically many relationships to keep remember. It's quite difficult. And uh, many of them are open problems. So if you ask me like the, the difference between two things, the answer is either going to be I don't know, because I personally don't know, or we don't know. Like as a community, don't know the answer. So um, n time is the time is for a deterministic Turing machine. And here I'm not mentioning if it's the two tape or the one tape one. We'll see why in a second. N time is the non-deterministic Turing machine. We'll talk about that one later. Space is the class of languages decidable by a Turing machine, which uses no more than f of n space. But you don't count the input as part of it. Uh, n space is not a term Turing machine space. Right? Uh, now here's finally uh, the point of today's lecture. We're going to define p to be the union of k equals 0 to infinity of time uh, n to the k. Probably seen this. We, uh, if an algorithm, if, if a problem, this is, oh, by the way, not algorithms. This is, these are classes of languages. 
Each class of language is, of course, a set of strings. And in some sense, we're using set theory here to understand uh, something about the algorithms by studying the problems. So this is a set of problems, uh, which is really a set of strings. So it's a set of set of strings. Um, each language in P has a polynomial time algorithm to decide the language. For each language in there, there exists a Turing machine which halts in a polynomially bounded number of steps on all inputs uh, and says yes or no within this, within this time bound. Um, so this is P. This is what P is. For computability theory, we talked about the decidable languages, right? We talked about LDTM, which is the decidable. Um, the decidable languages. And the reason we talked about the decidable languages, uh, we were concerned that these were solvable uh, at all. This is the class of problems solvable at all. P, I claim, and the rest of the today's lecture until the break, is I'm just going to be presenting evidence in favor of this, is P is uh, uh, efficiently solvable. So while uh, these are, of course, just abstract mathematical definitions, the definition of, of the decidable languages is those which are solvable at all. P is the class of languages we would like to think are efficiently solvable. Um, why? Why is P efficient? Why do we consider P? Uh, if, why do we consider that if a problem has an efficient out, has a, why do we consider the intuitive definition of efficient to be one which is bounded by a polynomial? That is what I, I'm just going to spend the rest of the day on, and I'm going to give you four points. One, um, every polynomial time algorithm has a sort of uh, like deeper mathematical characterization. If, if an algorithm runs in polynomial time, it's either ridiculously trivial or uh, it has, uh, maybe it's the wrong word, but it has some sort of like beauty. It has some sort of kernel sentence in it that like allows you to uh, exploit structure within the thing to achieve efficiency. Most problems have exponential time algorithms that are bad, right? Just keep guessing and checking, right? Imagine an exponential time algorithm for addition. Just guess the number, check if it, check it, and then if it's not right, then guess again, right? You can waste a lot of time doing this. So to contrast P from the exponential uh, time algorithms, if something is, if has some mathematical characterization, it seems to be within P. Um, to give you an example, um, uh, the shortest uh, path from S to T is shorter than an S T path through uh, any P. So consider a graph, consider graph search algorithms, okay? This is sort of like the heart of Dijkstra's algorithm and other things. If you have a, sh consider the shortest path from two things, from S to T, okay? The shortest path from S to T has to be less than or equal to, shorter than, less than or equal to, is less than, than equal to the shortest, than any path from S to T that goes through a point P, right? Just to give you a picture, we have S here, we have T here. The shortest path is going to be shorter than the shortest path that goes through some point P. This is a simple English sentence, but this characterization of graphs with positive weights is really what leads to the fact that these that those fast graph search algorithms work at all. They sort of inherently rely on this to be true. Um, and this is kind of a characterization of the structure. A graph can have all kinds of complicated search you can do. But the fact that you can think about this, then that allows you to break the problem up, and then this characterization allows you to solve the problem. Um, Uh, two, polynomials are closed under what operations? Do you remember? Uh, if f, g are polynomials, so are uh, f of x 
plus g of x, uh, f of x times g of x, and f of g of x, right? So if you have two, the p is closed, has some closure properties, like the regular languages that closure properties and so on. It's closed under this idea of efficiency. If you have an inefficient algorithm and an efficient algorithm, okay, consider a bad algorithm and a good algorithm. If you combine them, any way you combine them, you should get a bad algorithm out. Bad plus good equals bad. But if you have a good algorithm and a good algorithm, if you have two efficient algorithms, any way you combine them, you can compose them, you should be able to get a good algorithm back out. Um, f of g of, for example, if algorithm one runs in f of n time and algorithm two runs in g of n time, if at each step of algorithm one you run algorithm two, the runtime of your new composed algorithm is going to be f times g. So polynomial times polynomial is, of course, a polynomial. If you run one algorithm, pass the input to the other algorithm, and run that algorithm, uh, you run the two algorithms sequentially. That's the sum of polynomials. So you have a polynomial. You're still polynomial time. Um, so the polynomials are closed in these operations in the way exponentials are not, right? Like 2, of, two to the n uh, plus n cubed is not efficient. Even if the n cubed part is efficient, you are now bottlenecked by this part. You, you've ruined it, you know. So P is closed under these things, and efficiency to us is also closed under these things. Um, here's more of a thing that doesn't have, like, uh, should be named something. What is the worst algorithm runtime you've ever seen of, like, a natural problem? Like, of course, you could do a 17-dimensional array and just say it's n to the 17. Don't do that. What's, the, what's, the, what's, the, what's a good problem that you've seen that you remember? What is the highest runtime you remember from algorithms? Exponential. For which one? Do you remember? That's true. So, so many. Um, KSAT. Forget those. What about the other ones in P? That's true, though. Yes, those are yes. Knapsack does have exponential. Yes. What's the one with our graph algorithms? The cube? Yes. Bellman Ford had cubic time. Uh, Chain Matrix had cubic time. The worst one I've ever seen personally is for the LLL algorithm. It ran in n to the 8 time. And I hope I'm not misremembering the details of it. LLL algorithm is basically they gave a polynomial time algorithm for something they didn't think was polynomial solvable at all. So it was a big deal, the fact that it ran at n to the 8 time at all. LLL stands for Leinster, Leinster, Lovaz. So Leinster and Leinster are brothers. Lovaz is, of course, Lovaz. They could have just called it LL, and they could have shared the L, I guess. But so, <laughs> so I don't know which one is which brother, right? Um, uh, they made a monumental leap in the problem they were trying to solve. And I don't remember exactly what it was. I think it was something like words I'm not going to remember what they mean, but I remember what the words are. Like finding a short orthonormal basis in a lattice. I don't remember what those mean, but that's what it does. The fact that the problem is solvable at all, in polynomial time at all was a big deal. Because they, the only known previous algorithms were not polynomial time. It was like That was the result that it was polynomial at all. Um, N to the 8 time is unbearable, though, if you've actually tried to implement this. And I tried to impl implement this. And then you, what happens is you go to the terminal, you type an input, you test an input, and it just st hauls. Yeah, it stalls. It just doesn't do anything. It's like N to the 8 time. It's probably only time. It should finish. But it's just hanging. The terminal's hanging. The thing is, though, the real work was done by these guys because they were able to bring it from whatever beyond polynomial to within polynomial. Then it's now in the engineer's problem, OK? This problem was optimized, like, there was a, several papers on this technique called pruning. What that is, it doesn't matter. But basically, like, once you get this sort of sentence characterization of what the structure of the problem has, you can start saying, well, I'm going to use this float. I'm going to use this big num library. I'm going to, you know, I, uh, it's hard to measure the complexity of these optimizations and speed ups. But when you have the LL algorithm now in the fast, like, number theory libraries, this runs, it feels like when you, when you get the optimized version of the algorithm, it runs in constant time. It feels like you just hit enter on the terminal, and then it just done, It just finishes. And you keep trying bigger in inputs, and you hit enter, and then it just finishes. So in some sense, there, and we will prove later that there do exist problems that are like uh, of O of n to the 100 and uh, ha are not solvable in anything below n to the 99. Okay, Those problems exist, but they're non-constructive. We prove they exist. They exist. They're actually, you, can, you will build that kind of you will build a language that looks like that by diagonalization. It's time-arc theorem. You prove it's going to be in here but not in here by diagonalization. 
Um, but these are kind of useless. These aren't like real and practical ones. And the scenario I described with the LL algorithm has happened throughout, uh, it's not even history, but just like, you know, somebody has some problem and then they speed it up, sort of. Like, there's an insane amount of engineering you can do involved to get things to uh, what you want to be. Um, that's the other reason we use big O. Uh, if you recall, big O like hides the constants, the additive and multiplicative terms, and we take the largest one. That's really because you can change the definition of the Turing machine to get constant speed ups, right? It turns out you can take the alphabet and you, you increase the alphabet. If you double the size of the alphabet, you can half the time of the algorithm. So we don't really care about maybe an alphabet of size of a billion, and then your algorithm is now a billion times faster. That doesn't really make sense. That's why we care about the asymptotics and not the, the uh, runtime. Um, the final, solu uh, the final uh, thing is called the extended church Turing thesis. Uh, church Turing thesis. And uh, I think different people call it different things. But basically, we gave several definitions of a, uh, of these models of computers, right? We gave a one tape, uh, a DTM. We gave a two tape or K tape DTM. We gave a, a word RAM, right? There's all these kinds of variants of Turing machines with slightly things. Maybe you give it an, an, an addition instruction or something. Um, it turns out that these, the extended church, the church Turing thesis says these are all Turing complete. These are all equivalent to each other. They can simulate each other. The extended church Turing thesis says they can all simulate each other with at most polynomial overhead. So in some sense, the model may matter here. The difference between linear time and quadratic time matters because which one palindromes is in depends on which Turing machine you're using. But for these, we know it's in P at all because we know these can simulate each other. So I think if I recall, like this one can be simulated, the word RAM, which is like the fastest, can be simulated on the one tape deterministic Turing machine in like uh, t to the four steps, if I recall. Like uh, if, some, if, the, if the word RAM model takes t steps, then you have a one tape deterministic Turing machine which takes quartically many more steps. It's a lot. You know, you're, at, you're adding a fourth to whatever runtime. Like if this was quadratic time, now you have a one tape Turing machine which runs in n to the eight time. Fine. But n to the 8 is a polynomial like any other. So it's still within p. So within p, even though these, these machines appear to have different behavior specifically, uh, you can just say, like, we're in p, we're good. We can ignore the model. Um, and this is another thing you have to develop. Like, in algorithms, you might care a lot about the runtime. You might actually care about the degree of the polynomial. But it's maybe a bad habit from cryptography that I don't care about the degree of the polynomial. I care if it's polynomial at all. Um, we really want polynomial and like not polynomial. Like if it's polynomial, great. That's that's enough for us. Uh, and it's really the algorithms people to determine if it's cubic or quadratic or n log n or whatever. Um, and not to say that we couldn't do that, but I won't put as much of an emphasis on that. I really care about the fact that we can get, if we can get within p at all, then uh, that's really the big joy. And how, where, what, what level of p we sit at gets, it's more of an engineering question, it turns out, than it is uh, the kind of science that we want to study for complexity theory. All right, any questions on p? I spent an hour talking about one class, so, of one class of languages. Okay.